What's up, y'all? It's Johnny King. Johnny King with the Johnny King Show. Thanks so much for joining me, and I'm stoked to have a good buddy on with me, Ryan Schumacher. What's up, buddy? How are you? I'm great, man. How you doing, Johnny? I'm so good. You're, you're coming in from Nashville. Good old Nashville. Yep. Yes, sir. A little, little west of the city, out of, the, out of the, the buzz of Broadway, but pretty much Nashville. Oh, I love Nashville. It's so yeah. like I would consider I got a lot of friends there and just beautiful to just I love all the music, really. That's that's I, the thing. I love. The yeah, music. we still we've been here uh, coming up on two years, August 1st, and we still go down to Broadway, whether my wife is playing music w- once a week on Broadway or we just go down like tourists almost still and listen to it for an afternoon, walk around and just let it rattle off our heads and yeah. enjoy. Oh, it's so cool. It's so cool. Yeah. You moved to Nashville a couple of years ago from where? You're like from Michigan, Michigan. Detroit, about Detroit, Michigan area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, Much we upgraded. I was gonna say you <laughs> traded you traded up a little bit on that one. A little bit. In terms of the weather at least, you know. Yeah. Dude, Michigan is gorgeous in the summertime. It is. Somebody actually asked me um out in Oregon this past week. They said, you know, how bad is Michigan? You know, yeah. we and I said, you know, it, from May to September 30th, it is one of the most beautiful places. And the yeah. people are happy and they're out on boats and playing golf, hiking. And then that all kind of changes for six months. But it is. I, I really can't say anything bad about it. It's just a better move to come down here. Oh, totally. Totally. Yeah. Well, I love how we were we connected to a mutual friend. Um, yep. just thought that we'd vibe and we certainly have. Um, yeah. I, wish, I wish you lived closer because we'd probably hang out a lot more. Oh, for sure. But I yeah. love what I love hearing about your story and what I want to get into for the listeners and the viewers uh, is not only your journey through uh, sobriety, mm-hmm. alcohol, um, all, all the challenges came with that, but also this amazing aspiration of becoming a, a pro golfer later on in life. Yeah. You don't hear as often, you know, so I love your yeah. approach to that. So, yeah. We can get we can get all into that. So why don't you tell those that are listening who don't know you just a little bit more about, you know, what you're up to, just kind of the, the 30 second elevator pitch on Ryan. Yeah, yeah. So my life uh, on a daily basis consists of sort of several priorities, and they all kind of intermingle and, and trade spots on a, on a daily basis. But um, you know, we have. Uh, a little bit of property here. So we have three dogs, a cat and two goats and <laughs> probably another animal coming soon of some sort. Uh, yeah. And uh, that, and then my job, which is selling dental devices, which I just love. It's new. I just started May, uh, March 15th. Mm. Um, you know, staying sober is another priority, obviously mm-hmm. uh, that ranks really high up there. And then as you touched on my aspirations to turn pro as a golfer in probably three years and then play pro golf for two years in uh, kind of on the pro circuits in the, in the Southeast here, and then uh, go to Q school for the champion store and run with the big boys, which will be a, a challenge in itself. So, so cool. Uh, yeah. So, so we have a great time out here, no kids. Um, so we certainly keep busy with all the other things going on, but we do love that we can kind of at the drop of a hat, just take off. And like, you know, we just went out to band in Oregon to play golf and see family and things like that. So that's kind of the rat race that, that I live in. It's phenomenal. It's adventurous. I love it. It's yeah. Fun. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. It's, and it's cool that I've connected with you, you know, right, right before you become, you know, the, the greatest golfer of all time. Uh, let's hope so at least post 50 (laughs) yeah exactly. i love it i love it well let's uh let's rewind a little bit and just talk about when we're talking about the how you've overcome you know alcohol and take us back to even before that june 26th 2010 moment um what what was growing up in in the family of the schumachers and how was little Ryan, what, what do you feel like impacted him as, as you got older? And yeah, no, it's, it's a great start to sort of who I am today. And really I was given uh, a foundation and a structure by my parents who, um, aside from my dad who passed away, you know, 15 years ago, just last, last week, he, they would still be, my parents would still be married. They had an awesome marriage. Uh, older sister grew growing up outside the city of Chicago, 
you know, huge Blackhawks Bulls fan in the, in the Jordan era, um, huge into sports, uh, really involved in school. I was the school president of our eighth grade school. So I, I had a lot of contacts, knew a lot of people and life was great. Won a couple state championships uh, in hockey, um, which was kind of my first love. And really we traveled a lot. We were, you know, just a good old fashioned family. I mean, nothing. No, no drama. Um, I would still to this day when I've poured open my soul and unpeeled the layers, I still have never found anything in growing up that caused me to fall into addiction. Um, but as I got into college and a hockey scholarship sort of fell through based on my behavior, uh, slowly starting to drink and find out what drinking was like, you know, sort of dip my toe in the water of alcohol consumption you know, when I, when I threw away that scholarship at Michigan State University, I really then kind of began my descent into what would be my rock bottom about a month before I turned, you know, got sober. Um, so you're looking at from probably 1999 um, to 2010, I'd say it was slowly just getting worse and worse. And, um, but Growing up, it was, uh, we had a lot of fun. We were a happy family and it was all about my sister and whatever she was doing and myself and hockey. Uh, traveled all over the United States, all over Canada, sold at a high level. And I really thought at one point I might play some sort of level of professional hockey. I don't think I ever could have gone to the NHL, but definitely some semi-pro leagues, the East mm. Coast, Western professional or something like that. So mm. that was kind of life growing up, you know, it was just, it was good. And then sophomore year of college, I was home for a visit in Chicago and I remember walking in and my mom and dad were sitting at the kitchen table and it, it just felt different mm -hmm, the energy yeah right away and I'm like why are you both on the couch or standing up to say hi or what's you know they said come on in and uh, my sister had just gotten there as well and was in the kitchen and we all sat down and they let us know that my dad had cancer mm -hmm. and, uh, that was sort of the first real uh, roadblock or hurdle I had to overcome in life I think was understanding at the age of, you know, maybe 21 or two, something like that. Uh, actually, it was, yeah, it would have been 20 that, um, you know, that my father had a, a possibly deadly disease. Mm -hmm. So no, uh, when you say no drama, no trauma. No trauma is probably a better word, right? Yeah. No abuse, no, um, which is actually is a scary thing to me is because almost when I would sit around AA meetings um, later in life, I would hear stories about terrible things that happened to all these right. individuals. Some of them speaking about them for the first time at 50 years old, 60 years old. And here I was at 35 ish, you know, just coming into AA and in the program. And I was like, I, you know, I didn't have, I, I couldn't relate, but I listened and I was there to empathize that they had struggled, but um, nothing, nothing like that, that I was sort of pushing down deep and then later would revolt back with drinking at those people or at those instances. Let me ask you this though. I mean, do you feel like, and I, I mean, our story is parallel in a lot of different ways in terms of losing a parent, you know, mm -hmm. and 2010 being a, a, the pivotal year for both of us. And, yeah. uh, but I do question sometimes for me, and I think I've seen it in other people and I'm, I'm kind of throwing out my hypothesis to you too. Do you feel like that is, that was the challenge ultimately that you skated through life without a whole lot of like <laughs> resistance? Yeah. Because people's people could say, Oh, well I had, you know, I was sexually abused and that's what caused me to, you know, go down the, the, the road of addiction. Uh, you could say that you didn't have any issues. You didn't, until something finally like knocked yeah. you off the course, you weren't really emotionally fit either way. Right. hundred percent. Okay. Yes. A hundred percent. We've okay. discussed that here. My wife who um, wouldn't mind if I briefly spoke to the fact that she grew up on the other end of that type of a family um, upbringing where her mom was an addict, mm. you know, has passed away a couple of four years ago. Um, there was, you know, a lot of trauma and abuse and things like that, but she is resilient as all hell. And now I might be resilient, but I certainly wasn't at 19 years old. <laughs> I want to say the world was given to me because my parents instilled good values with hard work. I had a job early, you know, things like that. Like it wasn't just like spoon fed, you know, whatever I wanted, but 
I certainly wasn't challenged. Um, things kind of came easy to me. Again, I say all this humbly, but you know, sports really came easy. I did pretty well in school. I could talk to anyone in the world. You know, everybody wanted to hang. I had friends, things like that. I was discovering at an early age. It was it was cruising along, and then when this hit, boy, did I lose everything. I mean, I just slam. So I totally agree with that. Thought. It's that it's that mental uh, fitness, right? Mental mm-hmm. strength, uh, mental resiliency that I feel like. Because either way, whether you have a, a childhood where you're blessed to not have any drama or trauma, or you have something more like what your wife has, like total extreme trauma, if you're not given the tools either way, to, to tools either to deal with challenges in life or almost having someone to mentor you and creating artificial, sure, not trauma, but like a, even like a rite, a rite of passage for boys yeah. into men. Like if you don't have that to where you own yourself, well then I do feel like when shit pops up, you're, you could, you're going to be a lot more susceptible to getting screwed over, you know, not being able yeah. to handle what comes your way. Right. Yeah. Or even when the first trauma happens, really focusing on how are you going to handle this? Like nobody ever sat down and just said, they said, you know, we're, we're going to get through this. We're going to be okay. And I certainly can't blame a parent or anything, but what if somebody at that point said, Hey, this might be kind of hard for you. It might hit you differently than you think. It might come out of nowhere. We'd like to do some things to prepare you for this because the next couple of years might be kind of hard. So mm-hmm. how do you feel about that? Mm-hmm. You know, what do you think about that. Is there anything that you think would help you ponder it for a little bit? Let come back and visit a month. Maybe I was 19 and I would have said, whatever, I'm fine. But the option might have helped to arm me with how the next 10 years of my dad fighting mm-hmm. would have gone. And I might have been a little bit stronger. I certainly mm-hmm. never had kids would be a little more transparent with things like that. Yeah. Transparent. And then like, you know, like we're talking about maybe given what you've been through and realizing maybe to, to the extent of AA, like the, having the tools to combat stress, yeah. uh, unknown pandemics you know like whatever right, right? job but, loss anything yeah. yeah yeah i think that that obviously makes a huge difference which is part of this whole podcast and which is why yeah. i wanted i was excited to get you on because it's like man if you if you don't intentionally go about your life to to do the work right it's like there's no way you're gonna to expect you're doing so much work in preparation for a, a bigger dream with golf which we'll talk yeah. about in a second but if you don't do that there's no way you're gonna just step out there and expect to to win off of just you know, natural athletic ability, you know, hundred percent. Yeah. And yeah. we've talked about it multiple times with your, your weekends. It's the mental game, if anything, especially with golf, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just, right before we literally clicked record here, we said, I told you I was going to practice later because my short game was exposed in this last tournament, you know, and that you cannot go through anything without that preparation and whether, whatever you want to call it, practice awareness. Right. right. Which, which again, like you said, no, um, no fault of your parents. Right. Um, but I do feel like, I mean, I, I, God bless my parents too. They, they did the very best they, they could with the tools that they had. And yet there, there, there is a part of it. There was like, I, I wasn't prepared, you know, yeah. not to put yeah. it all on. That's, I got the full responsibility, but you yeah. know, you're a youngster, you're yeah. winging it, you know, but, and so the, even more, reason to have men like you and I and other guys who can maybe see little opportunities with future generations or with just our loved ones to say, Hey, you know what? I don't know if you want this, but there is yeah. this organization or this program, or there's some tools here that could maybe help you with this losing a parent or, yeah. you know, I think, I, know. I think you really touched on a hot button for me when you said the parents the best they could at that time. Yeah. I don't know that, my parents grew up with the options in, you know, mental health and um, uh, just programs and the thought process that men like you and I have, and many of the people you know and work with, and the people I've seen in recovery. Mm. Now we're not ashamed to say th- to have these types of conversations. I know if I would have asked the question that day, well, guys, what can I do to make sure I'm okay? I would have got a blank stare from both of them. Mm. I was not prepared or armed either. There's no way they had the tools or the knowledge to 
say, well, we've got some things lined up for you. These are some ideas we have. It, I don't know if it just wasn't like that when they grew up or in, you know, 1998, when I, we talked about this, it, it, the resources were harder to find, but there's no way they could have prepared me like I could prepare someone now based on what I've been through. So it's good to grow from it, you know? Yeah. And I think that is the opportunity of the generations that you and I are living in right now. It's like, you know, even with our parents, it's like some of it was, man, you're going through, you know, at least for my parents born right after World War II, you know, so they're baby boomers. And then there's still a lot of like so much unrest and civil unrest and world unrest. It's like, there's still some sense of, um, survival especially even probably from what their parents went through with the great depression and sure everything else and it's we're finally at that point i think in our generations where yes there's world wars but a lot of them we see from cnn you know there's right. a lot of still just as much trauma and ptsd and everything else that can create and i think why so many men are still suffering but we do have the the bandwidth and the tools and the the information at least at our yeah. fingertips to be able to plug that plug into it you know so i think you're a, a great example of what's possible you know that you don't have to throw your life away just because you've maybe had some challenges right yeah right, right. How, do you, how how uh well i'll get to that question actually in a second going back to um just kind of your your headspace getting into like drinking starting like where did you go with your dad's illness to starting to lose control a little bit yeah, I think that is probably the part of my story that surprised everyone, just because um, I really was what we would call from a 30,000 foot view, a really good, good guy, good person, you know, always helping people, always kind of there for people. And as I realized my purpose in life was not to be this hockey player that I thought I was going to be. And then he got sick. I had somehow stumbled upon a bar job in college. And that was the, really the catalyst and the outlet for me to um, sort of hide from the, this confusion that I had about who am I? Mm. So while there were these catalysts going on, I, I really internally, I sort of was just wondering what my identity was and I remember starting to drink. I, I didn't even drink till I was just before I was 21. And um, just like many other people that are quiet people maybe during the week, but have drinks on the weekend and come out of their cell and dance. <laughs> you know, I was that guy. I mean, I had gone from knowing who I was going to be to finding my identity in alcohol. And I worked at a bar. I knew everybody in town. My ego started to get so full of myself. Um, you know, I may have been kind to people, but inside I thought I was so cool just because I could get into any bar I wanted to and get free drinks and, you know, free food. And I mean, I ended up, you know, really doing some damage with my, you know, my school, like my uh, school, just my and everything. And I had to get in-state tuition and then pay for myself. So I went into some, some debt. And before you knew it, I mean, I was drinking, you know, five, six, seven days a week, oftentimes till six, seven in the morning after a work shift. Um, and that just became the norm. And it took me 10 years to get out of my undergrad. And after that, um, I took a little bit of a break where I collected myself and sort of got a job and, you know, well-paying job and for fresh out of school. And at about 30 years old, when I was just starting to pull it together a little bit, my father passed away mm. and I just went off the deep end. And I'll never know to this day, as much as I've soul searched, if I drank because I was so lost and sad that he was gone, or if I just used him as an excuse to hide deeper into my confusion of who I was. Mm. It was one of those two and it was hard. Yeah. I mean, that was going to be one of my questions. Like what, what was really yeah, the driver behind the drinking? Was it just pain? Was it distracting? Was it part of just the lifestyle and it was fun? You know, like what? A little bit of something. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit of all that rolled in together, to be honest. If anybody, you know, hears this or has gone through real recovery and real alcoholism or addiction, 
for me, maybe they can relate, maybe not. But once I started down that train, it, it, took, it was going to take a lot to stop it. Um, every day ingrained more and more into myself that that's who I was. Mm. The drinker. That's what I did. I wasn't the guy who was the hard worker or the father or the husband or the guy who helps his neighbors out. Who's that guy? Oh, he's a great, he's a fun guy, man. He's a great, oh, he's a big drinker. He's, you know, and that's, even though every morning I woke up and felt terrible and ashamed of myself and how I wasted another day and a lot more money and dollars on alcohol, I just would do it again because I truly believe that's who I was. I mean, it could not stop. That train was rolling and it was not taking a break until frankly, God intervened one day. Um, but it was, you know, it was fun while I was doing it in my head. And I look back now and know that it wasn't fun. It was false bravado. My ego was, you know, I was a egomaniac with an inferiority complex and truly just thought that I was the most important person in the world and Mm -hmm. wrong. Mm -hmm. Really wild. What were some of the costs? that you that you can look back on and see how i mean was there yeah was there anything pretty traumatic that you were getting yourself into that you're hurting other people or was it still kind of like still controlled chaos in some regards (laughs) or some damage for sure (laughs) yeah yeah i made a lot of amends um fortunately i was one of those alcoholics that during my process of hurting people i would immediately you know try to communicate with them how bad I felt. So a lot of times you just kind of blow people off and then, you know, never see them again. And that, that I think hurts a little bit more than the immediate uh, retract and and sort of try to make it up to them in a, in a clear, but um, I lost a job early on. That was a really good job. And they had worked with me for several um, months about trying to just get me help and, a sort aside from saying you have a drinking problem, you're an alcoholic. They try to get me to talk to different people and get help and you know, therapy. Um, I was married. And um, although I don't believe that we were the right fit long-term um, you know, this obviously played a role in it. I wasn't sure. you know, clear head. Um, I was in the hospital once for seven days. So I lost, started to lose my health, my pancreatitis, my pancreas was shutting down and the doctor actually looked at me one day and said, you have to stop drinking. And I said, I'll I'll be happy to take 90 days off. And he said, I can't talk to this kid. And he walked out on me and, you know, I told him to F off on the walkout. I mean, I was like, who is this guy? He's supposed to be a doctor. He's supposed to help me Mm -hmm. see that. I was being a little irrational with the ninth thing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I, I, one year I made $14,000. I mean, the social security statement. And it was like, you know, up, I was climbing towards a hundred thousand dollars at a pretty young age thinking, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. That's a goal. You know, I think, I think a lot of people have that goal right there, right? They say, oh, I want to make six figures one day. Uh, you know, so I came out of school thinking I was going to do that. And then all of a sudden I saw going down to 30 and 20 and 14 one year. And I thought, mm-hmm. wow, you've really, you've really thrown everything away as far as your career. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so many things that I, you know, can't even, I mean, there's so many little things that really I can't even explain in, in an hour or 45 minutes about how, how bad it really got. The worst one was probably, you know, being a hockey, growing up playing hockey, my mom, um, huge Blackhawks fan. My dad's one of their first day was at a Hawks game. The Hawks finally make it to the Stanley cup finals in 2010. And that was probably in May sometime. And I buy my mom tickets to go to game one in Chicago. So I told her I'm going to come home Friday night and uh, go to her house and we'll drive to the game together and I'll bring her back that night. Well, Friday night comes and I don't show up. I just don't show up from Michigan driving all the way. I just don't come. So the next morning I call her and I'm like, Hey, I'm really sorry. I didn't make it in, but I'm going to leave right now. I will be there in four or five hours. I'll pick you up. We'll go to the game. I didn't show up again. So I think I texted her around game time and said, I'm not coming. So there's my mom, you know, 70 years old at the time with her Bobby Hull 
Blackhawks jersey on waiting for me to show up and whisk her away to the game. And I just no showed her two times. And that was probably the worst thing I've ever done, believe it or not. You know, um, it's not like I, you know, was running around driving drunk, running into co- people, getting arrested or anything. Um, but I think just to do that to, to my mother who had given so much along with my father to me, my entire life, you know, that was mm-hmm. one that I think really kind of jarred me that Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes too, when we're doing a lot of those, you know, those things that you mentioned, like drunk driving, you know, and maybe breaking shit or beating, you know, getting into fights. And again, sometimes may, I mean, not really, I'm sure there's plenty of people that do that and they don't, <laughs> that's not enough to even, you know, that's not enough to get them to ground zero, you know, mm-hmm. but um, I do wonder if I were in that situation for you too. It's like, well, it's not that bad. I'm, I'm not doing those things. You can rationalize away making yeah. because it's, you know, you're a good drunk, you know? Or, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, don't know I didn't you fight know. anyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if you ever thought of those things, but um, what, oh, what, yeah. what was it that eventually, yeah. What was that God moment that June 26th, 2010 moment? Yeah. Um, I was um, dating a girl, a, a really, really great girl who had a three-year-old daughter and um, you know, we weren't, by any means in a, in a phenomenal relationship or anything, and probably because I was an active alcoholic, you know, so I'll take all of that. I mean, a really great person, but it wasn't like we were meant to be by any means or anything. And, um, I had gotten involved in helping take care of the three-year-old daughter here and there, even car seat in my back seat and really felt a responsibility, sort of like I was on a roll and I was going to sort of come out of this hole. And, uh, you know, right around that time that I bailed on that uh, Blackhawks game with my mom, um, it was getting close to, you know, me sort of losing that stranglehold I had on sort of that last piece of responsibility of feeling like I was maybe making a difference in a child's life somehow. Mm-hmm. Um, went out drinking one night and continued to drink for two straight months every single night. And, um, the night before I quit drinking, um, I was supposed to meet this girl out for her birthday and I no showed her in typical, you know, alcoholic fashion. And, um, the next morning she called me at 9 AM and said, Hey, uh, I, can you come up to the hospital? My daughter's in the hospital and she just has a urinary tract infection, but she's asking for you. And, as much as I hate to make this call, because I never want to see your face again, can you come up here for her? And I said, absolutely. So I jumped up out of bed, hung over as all hell, and went up to the hospital. And this poor girl was bawling her eyes out, red-faced. They, she would not go to the bathroom to give a urine sample. And we're all trying to get her to do that so much so that they pinned her down and tried to give her a catheter at one point and she's screaming and kicking and that wasn't working. So they stopped. And as I'm watching this from 10 feet away, I'm thinking this poor girl is in such pain and and angst right now. And I feel much the same, although I'm a 34 year old man at the time doing that to myself. Right. Right. And something just kind of hit me and they said, let's stop, let's take a break. And they went out of that room and everybody left the room and I'm sitting in there by myself and I hadn't been to church in ages. And, um, well, not true. Actually, I had gone a little bit to a community church, um, recently, but I hadn't been really engaged in God in a while, um, religious or non spiritual or non. Um, and, uh, out of nowhere, I had uh, a complete sensation of joy happiness and freedom and uh I could breathe and I had visit physically no more shakes for the moment I saw internally I saw a life that's the life I'm living right now Mm -hmm. I just saw a life I couldn't really feel it but I saw a life of happiness and being able to help people and do anything I, I wanted to accomplish and 
being reliable again, somebody that somebody would say, can you help me move? And I showed up there with coffee and donuts the next morning instead of, you know, not answering the phone. Mm -hmm. I just thought I felt amazing. Mm. It was like 30 seconds or a minute. I don't know how long, but, and then boom, it was gone. Mm. It was gone. It was gone. I felt sick again. And I looked at my hands and they were shaking from withdrawals and I thought I was going to throw up and I just sat there and stared at this wall for a little bit. And I said, I, I think I'm, I'm done. I'm never going to do that again. And I walked into the other room and I said, guys, I have to go. Um, something just happened and I, I need to, I need to call my mom, but I've got to go. And she said, see you later. And I called my mom and I said, I don't know what happened, but I think God just got into my soul and said, you're done. Mm. Enough is enough. And she mm. said, well, then why don't you ride it? And that was the last day I ever took a drink of alcohol. That's amazing. Coming up on 11 years next month. Wow. <laughs> I don't know, man. It was, it was absolutely unbelievable. Um, and I, <laughs> there's some more twists to the story, but I never had a drink and I did a drug or, you know, I really was never into drugs. So that wasn't a challenge. Um, but I, I had planned to never drink again. And uh, about three months later, when I was really kicking butt, I said, well, maybe I'll do this for two months. And then about four months total, I said, well, maybe I'll just do this a year. Like I'm feeling good. I'm dropping weight. I'm, I had gotten a new job. I was making 60 grand salary. I was like, I'm, I'm getting back. And uh, clearly my road to, you know, falling off the cliff was already twisting and turning towards the bottom of the Canyon. Uh, but, uh, you know, a guy one morning at 7 a.m. pulled me aside and changed my life. And, um, you know, I ended up going to AA and, and I, I really feel like that saved my life. I really Why so? You know, I, I know that the thinking of humans, at least this human, is not, it's hard to continue the same passion that you have in one instant when you feel the most powerful you do, no matter what it is for me, I might be so motivated at this very second, but to keep that for the rest of my life, how could I uphold that? Mm -hmm. I wasn't because I was already planning on drinking in a year mm -hmm. and I was playing hockey in, in the 7am skate. And these guys said, what, again, humbly, they were like, what, what's changed in you? You're, you're just going around everyone. You're scoring at will. Like, and I was so proud. I was like, well, I quit drinking, you know, five months ago, I quit drinking, you know, and I'm like, they're like, really good at this, you know? And I said, well, thank you. I said, you know, I've just, I was drunk every time I came here before. From before so, you know, I was a little sluggish. And uh, he said, you know, I'm 10 years sober. And I said, no way. Mm. That's cool. And I jumped over the bench and went for another shift and just didn't think anything of it, you know, came back and he said, look, you got to come to AA with me. Mm. Said, I'm good, man. I, I had this spiritual moment. It was amazing. Like it was, oh my God, it was crazy. And he's like, yeah, but you haven't dealt with what really caused you to drink, have you? And I was like, no, I, I guess I haven't. He's like, just come to a meeting with me. Come to one meeting. Come, please come to one meeting tonight. Mm. And I just said, yeah. I was deathly afraid of AA and the connotation and the stigma that came along with it. Because before I went into a group and said, I'm an alcoholic. I just used to drink too much, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And he brought me in and I was shaking like a leaf. I mean, I think I was like, my name is Ryan. <laughs> <Call it. laughs> totally. And, and uh, he brought me in and I found my people and I learned how to go through the 12 steps and learn how to get rid of what was, you know, all the shame and guilt that I had built up. And I learned how to let go of my father being gone and that it's okay. And uh, a lot of the hurt, you know, that I had was how I hurt people. I'm a, I'm a real sensitive soul. And so a lot of times I drank because I felt so bad about anything I'd ever done, mm -hmm. you know? And so I got my health right and I got, got through the program and I read and I got a sponsor and I prayed and I got on my, and I went to a uh, meeting a day for about a year and a half. I lost track of count, but it was like around 18 months, every single day. That was my priority mm -hmm. over. And that was it. That's, wow. I don't think I would have done it had I not found a group of support to teach me how to, how to do it. Mm -hmm. That's just me, you know? Yeah. I feel like the, 
the companionship or the the brotherhood if you will it's pretty pretty powerful you know yeah pretty yeah. pretty powerful so otherwise like I, I agree it's just going through it alone who knows who knows yeah it lasted you know i know who knows i mean I remember it was, uh, you know, up where I come from, I went to Michigan State and uh, the Michigan football game is the biggest game. And I was going home to visit my mom that October and um, right after I met my sponsor and uh, he, uh, I was in traffic on I-94 and I thought, why are all these people at 10 a.m. on a Saturday? Like, get up, you know, get out of my way. I was still learning how to not be a man baby all the time. And, you know, and, and then it dawned on me, today was the Michigan-Michigan State game. And I was like, I'm supposed to be there. Mm. My people are all there. That's my, I can see probably two or 300 friends. If I just pull off this highway and mm. go to an away game and watch, hopefully Michigan state win, which probably didn't happen. And uh, I called him and I, he talked me off the ledge and I just kept driving. And, and I'm, mm. Who knows? It could have been that day, five months later. <laughs> for sure. For sure. For who sure. knows? Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. No. That's so crazy. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm curious to switch, uh, ro- you know, themes a little bit and talk more about yeah. what you're getting into now. Uh, tell those that are listening, you know, just about this dream of yours and w- where it was birthed from, how you take your hockey swing into a golf swing. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not a happy Gilmore situation for sure. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, you know, I'd actually quit playing golf. I'd always been around a six or seven handicap. And then before, when I was drinking and playing a lot, I was like a three. So I could play, but, um, you know, when I got sober, I had a really hard time drinking on the golf course or playing golf without drinking. It was really hard for me and challenging for me to find the fun in it, you know, because I love to drink and, you know, it also made me better. I thought in my head, like I was relaxed and calm, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, which might be for some people, but not for me. Um, so when I met my wife, she said, Hey, do you play golf? You know, me and my dad are big golfers. I was like, oh, I used to. She's like, well, how good were you? I'm like, well, I was a three handicap. She's like, why'd you quit? And I was like, I guess I just couldn't, you know, I wasn't having as much fun out there. She's like, well, we got to play. So she probably regrets it now. She took me <laughs> and the hook, the hook, just their claws got right back into me. And so I think I have a little unfinished business with never finishing the the hockey career out the way I wanted and mm-hmm. with us not having kids, you know, I really, um, I need more. Like I love excelling at my job. I'm like always, you know, trying to be the top salesperson, like that, but I need more after work. And mm-hmm. so I slowly started getting back into it. I tournament golf and I got to a plus two handicap, well, scratch golfer, then a plus two. And I just said, you know what, I'm going to turn pro. And I'm going to go to Q school at 50 years old for the senior tour. I'm 45 in a month and a half. So, you know, I'm only five years away from that. My health is good. I've still hit it further than the 20 year olds at our course here. So it's not the distance. It's going to be the head. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've really just decided that this is my journey over the next five, six, maybe 10 years. I'm going to give it a shot. So I'm pretty pumped to make a run at it, but, um, you know, I'm facing my, my doubters for sure, who are telling me there's no chance. And honestly, I wish I could hear it every day. Cause all it does is motivate me to <laughs> yeah. out on the tee one day at a senior event thinking I'm here, you know? Yeah. yeah that's pretty sweet. So, well, I think maybe you touched on a little bit, but what is that real driving force for, for why you're doing this? You know, cause I mean, you're, I follow you on Instagram, obviously, and social media. You're you're out there, you're busting ass all the time. Yeah. You're, you're, yeah. Taking, you're taking your hacks. Like what's yeah. really you said unfinished business. Uh, but what else? There's gotta be someone else that's really driving you too to to go to the extent that you're doing and spending money to travel everywhere and playing tournaments. It's yeah. a cool dream. But what's it what's is, it's really fun. I think um I've got this sign right here that says that that I made at like a kind of like an artsy instead of like a it's called board and brush. Instead of painting with a twist, you can make rustic signs. It says half the dream is chasing it and don't ever quit. Mm. My motivation to continue to do it is that this is part of the dream for me is the grind. But the reason that I'm doing it internally is that I, I believe that I can do this. I believe that, and I have a real hard time within myself, not 
trying to accomplish something or complete something that I believe I can do. Mm -hmm. Second, something gets in my head that I can do that. I have a hard time not getting my butt up and going to try to do it. Whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm going to build a fence out here for this garden in weeks. As soon as I thought I can build a fence to look just like this other big one around the acre, mm -hmm. I could never just look at it and not. <laughs> <laughs> right. you know right so like i believe i can do this i mean if i go out and shoot 67 68 on a very hard course in town here i believe that there is a way i can find i can find a way to do that in a tournament with pressure with maybe a gallery maybe on tv one day or maybe it's just for few school to get in against other people mm -hmm. if I do it once and i believe i can reproduce that then i I'm going to do everything until I accomplish that. So it's really the concept of having the thought that a lot of us have that I can do this, or, you know, I can lose 20 pounds or I'm going to hit this new personal record with what I lift, or I'm going to build something, or my wife's going to be on stage at the Ryman or the Opry one day. Mm. If you have that thought, what a disservice to yourself that you, that you're not going to go ahead and give it your shot to do it. Totally. So that's, that's my thing is that I'm not out gardening because I've never had the thought that I could be a master gardener. You know, <laughs> we have this awesome garden that somebody else <laughs> really does well, you know, um, I cannot let myself not try to accomplish something that I see I can do. Mm. So that would be it. I, I think I'm going to do this thing. I just, I, I feel it. It's interesting too that when you sat there in the hospital, you had 30, a 30 second, you know, vision into what was possible, you know, yeah. but you not only saw it, but you really experienced it. You felt it, you know? Yeah. And it's almost like the, the same thing that, that, that just works for you. And I think it's probably a, a great recipe for a lot of people because you can have a vision, right. And mm -hmm. not really believe in it. And, <laughs> and, and because you don't really believe in it, you don't actually ever really feel it. It's like, Oh, I want to make six figures. I want to make seven figures, eight figures, nine figures whatever that means to you. But if it doesn't actually feel anything yeah. inside you, then you're like, eh, it's just another goal you write down on a piece of paper if that, right? 100%. But for you, it sounds like it's really something, because you. I, it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, you, you viscerally know how it felt to not pursue the hockey career. You know? Yeah, the yes. There, now you're, you're using that to even drive yourself, probably to some extent too to say, at least I got it. I know it's within me. I'm going to go for this. At least give it my, my yeah. full potential, right? Give it, give it because a hundred percent. That's why I mentioned I've got some unfinished businesses. Thank you for sort of putting a bow around that, but remember what it felt like to give up on that, mm -hmm. you know, to, to cut myself short when I had the real opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. And I've lost, lost let, I've let go of that regret because I don't live in that kind of world. But I'm not going to say I didn't have that regret before I learned how to process those types of things through it. Um, and absolutely. I mean, for me, I take all of those lessons, all that pain, and I spin it and put it into something positive. And for me, at this stage of my life, which who knows could change, I'm putting it into sort of an extra dream of, you know, playing on tour. I just I also believe that at that point, I can leverage some of my um, you know, far be it for me to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. M maybe I gain enough followers on Instagram or notoriety. If I have a story about the sales guy who made it to the U S senior open qualifier mm -hmm. that I can then influence some other people with this recovery and sobriety thing. Cause step number 12 is to give back. And so if I'm given back, then I'm not completing the 12 steps. And so there's a piece of me that down the road wants to help the masses with recovery and show them that if you can be sick in the hospital with pancreatitis, no job, you know, coming out of a terrible stretch run, some debt, making, you know, no money, bailing on people like your wonderful mother for a Stanley Cup game, mm. drink, then you... And you can turn that into whatever I become, even if this version of me, which is a sober man, then y'all can do it. Whoever's out there struggling. Yeah, no doubt about that. 
What, what would you say to those that may be listening and are struggling uh, with some form of addiction? If it's not drinking, maybe it's porn. If it's not porn, maybe it's drugs. Uh, yeah. It could be so many different things, right? Uh, yeah. It could be a work addiction for that matter. But what would you say to, to any one of those that, who are listening who maybe haven't had one of those spiritual moments? Yeah. You know? And they're like, oh, that would be nice if I had that to really motivate me. Like, of course he did it because he, he spoke to God, you know, but yeah, I don't hear, I don't have a connection with God or I don't feel like I got anyone who's got my back. What would you say to, to anyone who might be struggling and listen to that? Yeah, I love, I love that question. I've, I've gotten that many times because that, you know, in AA, we talk about sort of spiritual experiences and spiritual awakenings. Mm -hmm. um, I sort of had a spiritual experience first and sometimes people have them in different orders and sometimes they don't have them at all because they don't believe that and that's a hundred percent uh okay mm -hmm. so to those people who are struggling is i still think that from all the people i've helped the people i've counseled that have called me back from college and old jobs that i still get phone calls from they track me down and so hey i need to talk to you i always know what it's about it's not about my golf game it's about they need help Whenever I've talked to anyone or listened to anybody, they, I think my addiction was so bad that I think God needed to jump in and tell me, hey, dude, I'm stepping in, bro. You need to, you need to stop. Tapping you out. Yeah. Yeah. I'm tapping you out. But I will tell you, if I'm honest with you right now, I knew that I had that problem long before that spiritual moment I had for 30 seconds. I knew that I had an issue whether it was a friend who said something or just me looking in the mirror. And what I encourage people to do is to not wait for that glaring sign from some higher power being or the policeman with the red flashing lights behind you or the husband or wife who says, I'm leaving. I just encourage you to think that if you have that feeling that you have a problem, reach out. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest thing because as it showed with me, if I didn't go to that AA meeting that day, I could sit here and tell you right now I was going to drink again sometime in my life. I already had a plan to do it around a year. So as much as God was awesome and he knows I thank him every day, even he couldn't do it. I was about to bail on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what kept me in is a program, a structure, a support group, fellowship, reading, Whatever you, you know, there's, there's different combinations here. I mean, there's a recommended program, but you can, you can do a bunch of things, you know? Yeah. yeah. I would just encourage if anybody's listening right now, if anybody's having that problem, find me on social media. I'll listen to you. I'll pick up the phone at three in the morning. I do. I always have. That's awesome. And just make a call, call somebody, email somebody. There is somebody on another line that can walk you through not having a drink for one 24 hour period at a time. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's how you all start. We all start that way. Totally. Like it's not like. Let's be clear. That moment was on a Saturday. It's not like a, or on a Sunday. It's not like on Monday I didn't want to have another cocktail. You know, it's mm -hmm. I was shaken and withdrawn. It's not like Wednesday I wasn't like, ooh, it's hockey night with the boys. What I'm in the locker room. I want to have. You know, there's still a way to get through it. So. Totally kind of long-winded, but I really think it's important to stress that we've got to latch onto that feeling that we have when we look in the mirror and say, I've got a problem because we mm -hmm. all for any other experience and we know it. Well, it's interesting too, because, <clears throat> excuse me, I've talked about uh, the story and I'm not going to tell the whole thing um, on a previous podcast, but just, you know, we were, we were really good uh, my soccer team, college, junior year, but we lost like three or four games uh, where we were up a goal going into the last 10 minutes. We were soft, mentally soft. Going through losing those games, the next year, I fell back on, we all fell back on that, be like, this is not happening again. So rather than in those last 10 minutes when it's a tight game and they were starting to press, you know, yeah, yeah. a lot of teams will play not to lose. We were kind of like, fuck this, fuck yeah. you. Yeah. you know, and we're going to, and, and we, and we crushed. We lost a game or two that entire season, went to the NCAA tournament. We had a great, great season that I'll always remember. And I feel like for you, the same thing. And, I, and I'm thinking about other people that are listening too. It's like a lot of times, again, like we were talking about at the very beginning of this, this conversation, like the challenges that we have in life, <laughs> if, if you let them define you, well, then you're going to be a drunk the rest of your life. Versus, 
using it as the catalyst for for greatness and being like yeah because of this now when you're 53 and you're going to be in a tournament and you're struggling you're going to remember all of these weekends when you actually did struggle yeah maybe you lost a tournament when you could have been like hell no this is not happening you know 100 but yeah absent, you know yeah and and you know i'm gonna lose my mom at one point just like i lost my dad mm -hmm. i've grown myself through recovery the other thing is like this program of recovery whatever it's it's defined by whoever however you do your recovery yeah it builds you to be stronger flat out when I just had a job that I absolutely hated for two years because we moved here and I had to grab something and I had people that were, yeah, I was at my wits end with literally people telling me they're just not going to work hard. Uh, it's hard to accept when you're trying to run an entire, you know, um, I didn't go drink, you know, or when my wife lost her mom or uncle and her grandma in the same year stretch and shit hit the fan, I didn't go drink. You know, so I've learned now to take all of those tough experiences and build on them. And I'm like, fuck you. I'm not going to drink. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not doing it. That is not the answer. Mm -hmm. I love it. And I think that's, like I said, it's just why I love your story. Um, and I'm just excited to see where, the, you know, the, the coming years takes you, especially when it comes to your golf dream is that uh, yeah. I, I hope that all of these stories that, that listeners you know, experience through these episodes, give them some sort of greater compassion, you know, greater tools and strategies uh, for their own recovery and whatever issues they're working through in their life, you know? Yeah, um, for it's, sure. It's, it's, it's not healthy to compare, you know, you, the listener's story with Ryan's, you know, it's just like you're on your own journey and just look at how we can, take glean you know inspiration from your story and apply it to their own you know and i think yeah. that's important part so i love yeah. it man. that's such a good story yeah. we could, i think we could keep chatting about it uh any other part of the story anything else that you can think of that you want to touch on before we wrap it up i think um for me i've conveyed a message today that i really had no agenda on but i feel good that um hopefully i hopefully we touched on just what it's like to be at the bottom of the barrel in life <laughs> and climb out of it because you just said everybody's going through something and they're different. And yeah, we, we definitely don't do the comparing game around this house either because you don't know what somebody's going through until you're in their situation. You really don't. And, um, but you can, I feel like gain inspiration, like you said, from somebody who's gone through it and say, Holy shit. I mean, we're talking, I was sleeping on, on the floor of a basement on a futon mattress pad only mm. oh, college degree, you know, great up, great upbringing potential through the ass. I went, a, I went a different way for a while, mm. but I turned it around. And now my life for what I like and appreciate is bountiful and full of everything I could ever. Imagine. Right. Right. Well, yeah. and I, and I also think there's a part of it where you just weren't, um, you weren't ready for it. Had you, had you gotten into semi-pro or even pro hockey, yeah. given how you experienced life, just the ego and the parting, like yeah. how much worse could it have been if you had even more money, you know, to throw out. Right? Oh yeah. It, it, we always say that hasn't happened yet. And there's a lot of yets out there <laughs> yeah. just because all that stuff didn't happen. Yeah. There, the yets are always out there. So it was the way it was supposed to go. I'm, I'm grateful for my dream. And I, I love the fact that I'm can't drink alcohol because now I don't want to. And mm -hmm. I get, you know, I get to do a lot of other things that a lot of, you know, people my age don't get to do just because I feel great all the time. And, yeah. you know, so yeah, it's awesome. Thank you so much for, for having me on, man. And, I'm really privileged to be, you know, kind of in your company, so to speak, with uh, this kind of stuff. This is what we're all trying to do, right? We're just trying, we're trying to find ways to, I don't know, maybe smile a little more, you know, maybe get through some hard stuff, maybe help other people yep. open up a little, you know, and I love what you're doing. And I just can't say enough about you and your journey. And thank you so much for having me on your show. It's privilege oh it's awesome man i love it you're you're so welcome and, and thank you too because i think it goes both ways for sure um and in in the 
in the giving, there's also the receiving and vice versa, right? So yeah. um, I, I really feel like it's it's cool. And, and, and I think if this were, uh, I don't know, let's say, let's fast forward 10 years and you're, you know, you, you're the man, right? <laughs> who, who knows if, if you're going to have time to, to, I don't know, what, what I'm ultimately saying is like, it's really cool for someone who's listening to this who might be struggling to realize that they can reach out and, and yeah. connect with you because you're an actual person who cares and, and is willing yeah. to support them. Um, Always. You know, life Always. Might be different 10 years from now. So how could someone reach out and get in touch with you? Yeah, I think the best way is probably on Instagram. It's, oh, my name is Ryan. Um, my Instagram handle is Chase Golf Dreams. Uh, many people around Nashville still call me Chase, but then I kindly correct them. Um, that's chase golf dreams is probably the best way just because um i haven't quite got my other instagram page and website and everything up and running that i may do in the future i'm still kind of toying around if i want to so that's the easiest way and again just to reiterate um i don't care what time it is if you direct message me and say i need help or tell me more or how do i do it get all of my attention that's one thing i've done for a lot of people and I drop everything. You can ask my wife. I just pretty much shut it down and I'm like, Hey, I got to take this call. Somebody needs my help. So that's um, awesome. I'm first. That's awesome. Yeah. Chase golf dreams. That's on Instagram. Um, just a privilege, man, to chat with you. Hope you guys enjoyed the, the, the uh, podcast episode with Ryan Schumacher. And uh, like I said, you'll be seeing a lot more of him on the senior golf tour in a couple of years. So Thanks, bro. Appreciate you having you too, man. This conversation. Yeah. All right, everyone. Thanks, Thank, yeah, man. Thanks again for everyone for for tuning in for listening to the podcast. Uh, hope you found some some really valuable nuggets because I think there's there's a recipe right there that he said uh, for working through some tough shit and coming out uh, stronger for it. So, until we connect again on another episode, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you soon. Cheers. <laughs>